So it, we're going to stick in the stick to the local case again. So R is going to be a DDR, and I probably want to assume that it's complete or unsellable. Let's just say complete. In the case it's fraction field, and I'll stick to the other notation that I was using. Um, but I'll write gamma K okay, for the Galois group. So we're going to have other G's floating around. Okay, so we want to look at uh, quasi finite tau group schemes over R. Remember, quasi finite just means the fibers are finite. So suppose G is such a thing. is quasi finite the tau. And I'm also going to assume it's commutative and maybe finite presentation. So we can take its k bar points. So when you go over k, g becomes a finite tau group scheme over big K. And such things are classified by Galois modules by taking the k bar points. So this is the Galois module that classifies g over big K. And of course, we can do the same thing over little k. I'm going to call that n0. And this is the gamma sub little k module. And remember, gamma sub little k, the Galois group of the residue field, is just the quotient of the big Galois group by inertia. I can think of it just as a gamma k module with inertia acting trivially. Okay, and since G is a tau, the R points or the R bar points of G map isomorphically to the K bar, little K bar points of G. And of course, these include in the big K bar points. So this thing that I call the M0 here, you can really think of that as a sub of this thing that I call M. And in fact, since M0, the Inertia action is trivial, so it's actually sitting inside the inertia invariance. I just mean the ring of integers in K bar. Well, you could put the ring of integers in the maximum amplitude extension there as well. So, in other words, associated to our, our original G, we built this pair, M and M0, where M is a gamma K module. And M0 is a submodule of the invariant of the inertia invariance. It's Galois statement. Okay, so. Okay. And the basic fact that this is an equivalence of categories. schematic picture in my mind, which I think is helpful. So there's this analogy that you should think of DDRs as like uh, a little disk and the fraction field is a function disk. Uh, so spec R, if you, you know, draw the disk like looking sideways onto the disk, spec R would be this. And spec K would be the function disk. There's like a point removed in the middle. Now one of these G's that's quasi-finite, so it's sitting over spec R, and there's going to be like a bunch of sheets. And some of them are going to look like this, and some of them are going to look like this. And the ones that look like this, I mean, these are the sections that extend over all of R. This is the M0. And this thing is all the sections M. This is kind of what a quasi finite thing looks like in general. There could be some Ks inside the coordinate ring. doesn't it? Yeah, but you only get that kind of constancy if you have some kind of finiteness. Like k is flat over r, right? And I mean, one of those pictures is what k looks like. It's 
by the finite module. That's why it doesn't work out. So some remarks related to this equivalence of categories. So if H is a subgroup of G, so suppose G corresponds to MM0, and H corresponds to NN0, then N is a sub of M and N0 is a sub of M0, and the statement I want to make is H is closed if and only if N0 is the intersection of M0. So in other words, in this picture, you're saying that to make H, you're allowed to take some subset of these sections and then maybe delete some points and these ones that extend and close if and only if you don't actually delete any points. And if H is closed, then the quotient is a a tau quasi finite group scheme. And it corresponds to the obvious thing. M mod n and zero mod n. Uh, if we start with a group over k, so this corresponds to some m. And it's clear from this classification of quasi-finite ones, that there's a maximal and a minimal extension to a quasi-finite tau group scheme. So to specify an extension, we just have to specify an M0, right? This is some equivalence of categories. We can take either M0, T0, or the full inertia, right? So this is a maximal and minimal extension. So max extension by taking M0 as inertia variance. Minimal extension by taking M0 P0. This is called the extension by zero. Uh, so you see that if we have some G corresponding to M M0, we can make an H a sub by taking H to correspond to M0, M0. H corresponds to M0, M0. So that's like taking just this set of sections here, the M0 ones. So you see that this H is actually finite. And it's the maximal finite subgroup of G. And it has the property that its special fiber coincides with the special fiber of G. And this is the key property that I was using last time. I'll, I'll recall that argument in a second. But this is the kind of thing that I need. And one, one last thing that I want to say is that if you have some group, say, G over R, which is flat and quasi-finite, and killed by n, where n is invertible in R, and that automatically means that G is a tau in this situation. So it fits into this picture. And we know that we get examples of such G by taking the n torsion and smooth group schemes over R. Like when we have a minimal virus stress model, so it gets n torsion is like this, so it fits into this one. Okay, so let me just recall the argument that I did at the very end of last time, which I think will now be a little more clear. So, what we wanted to prove was that if, if you use an elliptic curve that has semi-stable reduction, then the K module has an inertia invariant. So let me just sketch the proof very quickly to remind you of the idea. So we let G be the L of the N torsion, in the smooth part of the minimal bar stress model. So 
This is a quasi-finite tau group scheme. And then what we want to do is we want to take this H, this maximal finite subtrain. And so the point is that the special fiber of H is the special fiber of G. And this is the L to the N torsion in either an elliptic curve or a torus, because we're assuming semi-stable reduction. And in particular, it's points over k bar contain a z mod l of the z mod l of the n z. And that's a subgroup of the points. So h k bar is a subgroup of h of k bar. And it's this n zero thing. I guess I didn't even need to say that. This is I could just forget H and just look at G of K bar. So this contains a Z mod LZ, Z mod L the NZ. And so this does also. This is just the L to the N version <coughs> and E. So this shows that you have this L to the N point, a point of order L to the N inside the, I mean, this was our N0, so that's inside the inertia variance. So that's what we needed to show. Anyway, the point is you get this LDN torsion point downstairs and you can lift it up to the unramified extension of K, which is the structure of these things. Okay, um, so now I wonder if we want to talk about in models. First, for a little bit curves, and then we'll go to the viewing varieties in general. So a good reference for this, uh, Naren models of elliptic curves, is chapter four of Silverman's second book. Uh, so we're not going to have enough time to do a lot of things concerning proving existence of neural models and properties of them, but he does the full theory for elliptic curves in this chapter. So here's sort of a motivation for narrow models in terms of things that we've already talked about. So suppose we have an elliptic curve over our K, and I'm going to write now W for its minimal Weierstrass model. So I called this script E last time, but I'm going to use that letter for the narrow model. So we'll call it W. So remember, this is just you took an equation for you that had the integral coefficients and a minimal discriminant. It was evaluation. This W is defined by that equation. So W is proper. And so that means that it's every k point of E extends to an R point of W. And that's a good thing. But W is not so good because it's singular. So if you look at the smooth locus of W, we, we saw that this, or I said that this was a smooth group scheme over R. And that's a good thing. But we know that not every K point of E extends to an R point of the smooth locus. That was the subgroup that we defined E sub zero. So 
So it would be nice if you could have some model for E over the integers that combine the good properties of both. There's a smooth group scheme and points extended. And that's what the NERIT model does. So the NERIT model of E. So I'll call that script E. Is a smooth group scheme over R. And it's R points at the K points. So if you think about how such a thing has to work, I mean, so we have this E0 of K. And we know that this maps surjectively down to the K points of the smooth part of W. And this is sitting inside of E of K. And then the quotient was something finite. Now I'm telling you that there's some way to something that you can put here, some other group scheme, so that you get a nice subjective map here. And well, I mean, I think, well, maybe, okay, this isn't a proof, but it's not hard to imagine that this thing here is going to have to be the connected component of the identity of this thing, and then there has to be some finite component. Not really much other choice in how this could possibly work. So the smooth part is actually the identity component of the neuron model. Here are the k points of the neuron model. And then this quotient is pi 0. We get some diagram like this. So the smooth part of the virus model we already constructed was the identity component of the neuron model. And sort of to get the full neuron model, you just have to add some other components in the special fiber. <coughs> so that says a little bit about what it looks like, but I haven't actually defined the neuron model yet. I just told you some of its properties. So I'm going to wait for a little while to give the proper definition, uh, but we'll give a working definition first in the case of what the curves, which will at least tell us how to compute. So uh, there's a notion of um, a minimal regular model of just any curve. So I want to recall that. So suppose we just have a curve over the generic fiber. So by a regular model for C, is a flat, proper, regular scheme script C over R, whose generic fiber is what we started with. There's an extension over R, which is proper and flat, and with the important property that it's a regular scheme. And so such a model C is minimal. If for any other model, or any, what I call this a regular model, for any regular model C prime, <coughs> there exists a map, some C prime to C, extending the identity over K. And the basic theorem is that these minimal regular models exist and are unique. And so they're at least in principle so you can find a, a regular model for C by just taking any model and doing a bunch of blow-ups and normalizations.
So you just pick some proper flat model of C over R. It's not going to be regular, but you can blow it up a bunch and do some normalizations and find something that's regular. And then once you have a regular one, you can get a minimal one by blowing down certain divisors. And that the schemes over R. No, it's unique because it's extent. I mean, I'm telling you what it is over the generic fiber, which is dense. So uh, there's this process which, maybe at least in principle, is sort of a procedure for finding these things, but it might actually be very hard to carry it out. In the case of in the case of elliptic curves, they give an actual algorithm to go through and find a minimal regular model. And so here's a, a fact or a definition, depending on what perspective you want to take. So E is an elliptic curve. It's Neron model, the Neron model of E is the smooth locus in the minimal regular model. try to do two examples to make this a little more concrete. I tried actually doing some computations this morning and I think I have a few that worked out. <coughs> hmm? No, I think that's the whole thing. The connecting component is the smooth locus and the virus truss. Okay, so the first example is an easy one. So I'm going to take k to be qp for these examples. The total spaces, but the special fiber is not here. So we can get the connected component in like fiber wise. I think what Kartik was talking about was. I mean, if you have some scheme over spec R, like you know the neuron model, you can sort of think about the special fiber and it has a bunch of components, and you can delete all the non-identity components. That'll give you some open subset, and that's usually called the identity component, even though the total space is connected. So the first example I want to look at is y squared equals x u plus b. <coughs> this is my e. Okay, so what kind of reduction does he have? Additive, yes. This, this equation is a minimal fire stress model already. <coughs> the coefficients are integers, and the valuations are small enough. And when you reduce my p, you get y squared plus x cubed, which is custom. So this is my e, and the same equation defines w. So W is smooth except at one point. We're smooth away from the point P, which is given in coordinates by x, y, 0, 0 in the special value. For those of you who are unfamiliar, may have maybe forgotten, 
regular is an absolute property. The scheme in smooth is a relative property. So the scheme is just regular, independent of it mapping anywhere. And a map of schemes is smooth, basically, if the fibers are not singular. So that's, that's the difference. And this point P is not a smooth point because in its fiber, it's a singular point. Right? And if I look in the special fiber, mod P, I just get y squared equals x cubed, and this point zero, zero there is a singular point at that curve. But the claim that I want to make is that this is a regular point of W still. So W is regular at P. It's regular everywhere else because smooth points are regular. So this is the only place where it could possibly not be regular, but it is actually regular there. And so let me show you why that's true. So let A be the ring R. So R is my DDR, it's actually ZP in this case. I join XY mod this equation. So spec A, and let, um, let M be the maximum ideal cut out with XY and P. So spec A is some affine open of W. <coughs> and my point P in W corresponds to the ideal F. I want to say that this max y deal n is regular. <coughs> so regular means that if I look at m mod m squared, the dimension of that space is the same as the cold dimension of a. So let's look at m mod m squared. Well, this is m, so m squared, we know the generators of it. I just square this ideal. It's generated by all products of two generators. So x squared, xy, y squared, p squared, px, and py. <coughs> but now we can use the equation for y squared. Right? Y squared is in here. So we know something about y squared. Y squared is equal to x cubed plus p. <coughs> and since x cubed is in m squared, this shows you that p is in m squared. And so I can just replace this y squared by p, and then all these things are already there because they by p. So m squared is really generated by x squared, xy, and p. And so when I look at the quotient, m uh, m squared, if you just think about it, this has a basis consisting of x and y. So in other words, the dimension of m mod m squared is 2. And that implies that m is regular. So since w is regular away from p, and regular at p is just everywhere regular, so w is a regular model. And I mean, the special fiber of w is y squared equals x cubed irreducible curves. There's nothing you could blow down, so it's minimal. So it's deep and more regular model. And so the narrow model for E is just the smooth locus, which is the complement of P. So in particular, the special fiber is just the additive loop and it's connected. So this shows you that E is equal to E0. In this case. So in this case, the narrow model isn't so interesting. It's just something that we've already seen before. Is this clear? Are there any questions about this? E0 was the set of points in E, such that when you extended them to an R point of the minimal Weierstrass model, they reduced into the smooth locus. So they're exactly 
E0 is exactly the points that this P. All right, so let's do a more interesting example. So I, I want to look at y squared equals x2 plus p squared. It looks almost exactly the same, but it's going to be very different. So a, a lot of the initial comments stay the same. Um, this is already a minimal Weierstrass equation. So this is the equation for the minimal Weierstrass model. And it's again smooth away from the same p. But now the difference is that p is no longer a regular point. And so again, we'll look at it from the point of view of this ring of maximum ideal. m mod m squared in this situation. And so m squared is still, I mean, m, m is generated by the, the same things, x, y, p. So m squared is still this. And now we can try the same trick and use the equation. So y squared is x cubed plus p squared. x cubed is still in m squared. And y squared is in m squared. But all this tells us that p squared is in m squared. You don't get that p is in m squared anymore. So I mean, this really just says you can ignore y squared or p squared instead of y squared. But everything else you need, there's no other implications. And so if you look at m mod m squared, this has a basis consisting of x, y, and p. That p you can no longer get rid of. So it's three-dimensional, so it's not regular. Okay, so we want to find the minimal regular model, which means we have to blow this point up. So uh, let's do the computation, some of it. So write this. R is the string. A, A is the string. I'm going to let B be the blow up algebra of A at this idea. So this B you can think of as the subring of A adjoined T. So T here is just some indeterminate. You think of t being graded and having degree one and everything in a having degree zero. E is the subring generated by uh, tx, ty, and tp, the generators of our ideal if you want to blow up. And so the blow up of spec a at p is just proj of b. This is the definition. Remember that spec A was just one open set of, or W. So this isn't the whole blow up of W, it's just one half line chart. So we want to understand what this proj is. And one way to do that is, well, you know, the way proj is defined, you can take you know, your elements of degree one and invert them and take the degree element, zero elements in, in those rings. And spec of those gives you an open half line cover. So let's look at those things. So I'm going to let uh, B1, B, uh, you take the ring B, you invert Tx, and you take the degree zero elements in it. And then uh, B2 will be the same thing but with Ty. And B3 is the same thing but with Tp. 
and I'll let ui be spec of bi. And the ui are an open app on cover of project. Okay, so we want to see what these views look like. So let's start with B1. So basically the idea with B1 is that we've added TX, TY, and TP, and now we're inverting TX, and we want to take the things that could be zero. So all the Ts basically just have to go away. And so all you've added basically are Y over X and P over X. So this B1, you can really think of as R join X, Y, and then Y over X, and P over X. And then sort of mod the obvious equations. So this Y squared equals X cubed plus P, Y squared is X cubed plus P squared. If I divide by X squared, I get y over x squared is equal to x plus p over x squared. And so that's an equation that's supposed to hold in b1. We can also get rid of y as a generator because y is equal to x times y over x. And another relation that's supposed to hold is that x times p over x. So basically, you should think of y over x and p over x as indeterminates. And this is an equation between two indeterminates, x times that is p. So this is what b1 is. And so we can see what the special fiber of b1 is by just making p be 0. But p over x doesn't count as 0, because that's indeterminate. It's not p times 1 of x. So the special fiber here is just x times p over x is 0. In this equation again, y over x squared is x plus p over x squared. And so it's easy to see what this looks like. So this first equation says that either x is 0 or p over x is 0. So in the case that x is 0, this thing goes away. You just get this squared is that squared, which means that one is just plus or minus the other. So y over x plus or minus p over x. So that's a union of, that, that's two lines. That's two lines going like that. And when p over x is 0, uh, this goes away, and you just get that x is that squared. So again, that's also a line. It's a parabola, but it's a line. And these three lines meet at the point where x, p over x, and y over x are all 0. There's all line on this line. So this thing, U1, is three copies of A1 arranged like this. So maybe in the interest of time, which is not being extremely boring, I won't go through the details of all the other charts. But here's what happens. I'll, I'll leave this to you as an exercise. So in U2, you get three lines with no intersection. Where it's really two A1s and a GN. And these two A1s glue with two of the A1s in U1 to make projective spaces. And the GM sits inside of one of those A1s. So U1 union U2 is like this, but now two of them are P1. This one's A1. And if I did my calculation correctly, this union already contains U3. <coughs> so you don't get anything new there. 
So the special fiber of project E just looks like this. And that's almost the special fiber of the blow up of W of P, but there was another point that we omitted, and that closes up that other A1 into a P1. So the special fiber of the blow up of all of all like this, the blow up at P of W is this shape. So these are P1s. And this is, in fact, uh, a minimal regular model. And so that implies that, I mean, the Nairn model is the smooth locus in this, so you're just deleting this point. So the special fiber of the Nairn model is three copies of GA. So it's pi zero in particular is Z mod three zero. All right, so here's a, two more examples that I'll just quote from tables to see kind of see kind of some of the phenomenon that goes on. I haven't worked these out myself. So if E has multiplicative, if E has split multiplicative deduction. And uh, the valuation of the J invariant to be is negative n. Remember, if you have multiplicative reduction, your J invariant is not integral. So if you write it as negative n, then n will be positive. So in this case, the special fiber sees the minimal regular model. The special fiber is again some arrangement of P1s, but it looks a little different. There are n P1s, and they're arranged in a cycle called the polygon. Uh, I don't know how many times it will blow up to find the minimal regular model. Wait, I mean, you don't blow this thing up anymore. This is the special fiber in the minimal regular model. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And actually, if, if n is 1 here, then you have one P1 connected to itself like this. That's a plain nodal curve. And in this case, the minimal virus stress model uh, is the minimal regular model. We already know that if you take the minimal virus stress model and reduce it, you get a nodal curve like this. So in that case, n is 1 and you don't have to do any blows. And one more example, if you take the equation y squared is x cubed plus p cubed. And the special fiber looks like this. So it, these are p1s. All these things are p1s, except for this one that has four lines crossing it is not reduced. It has multiplicity 2. So the rest of these guys have multiplicity 1. So when you take the narrow model, you're taking the smooth locus, and this whole component gets thrown out. <coughs> Every point along it is not reduced. And so you pick up these four things, and so the component group has four elements in that case. So if E has bad reduction, then the special fiber of its minimal regular model always kind of looks something like this. It's always some arrangement of P1s with some crossings or singularities and multiplicities. So I'll say that CK is made up of P1s. 
singularities and non reducibles You can always represent it as some kind of graph like this. And uh, Neron and Kodaro classify the possibilities that can happen. They correspond in some way to Dinkin diagrams, actually. These graphs are like the dual graphs to Dinkin diagrams. And an important <coughs> corollary that comes out of the classification is that as long as E does not have split multiplicative reduction, Narrow model, the special fiber, the star is not equal to four. I said this last time in a, in a different language. And this is something that we're going to use later on, which is why I mentioned it now. Okay, are there any questions about this? Yeah. Evaluations in a minimal Varshaw's equation? Those are four and six. I think I just said that it's cardinality to down here. I think it should be four. You can get like Z mod 3Z and Z mod 4Z. Right, if you have slow multiplicative reduction, you get Z mod NZ. Right? Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about Neron models for abelian brightness. So I'll just deal with the curve case. So based on the discussion so far, it's probably completely unfair how you would go about generalizing the abelian brightness, because everything that we've been doing has been with either explicit dash pass equations or the theory of minimal models for curves, which I don't think really generalizes the higher dimensional things. So the, the key to sort of understanding what their model should be in higher dimensions is to give a functor of points criterion for it for elliptic curves. And I think that's the best way to understand the bridge to the higher dimensional case. So here's um, a fact or a theorem, whatever you want. So it, suppose E is the Nairn model of E. Suppose that I have some other smooth scheme over R x. But normal x is generic fiber. Then the maps from x to E over R are in bijection with the maps over K. So the real point of this statement is that if you have any map over the generic fiber from X to E, you can list it to over R to the narrow model. It's important here that X be smooth over R. So this motivates <coughs> the definition, which is the real definition of narrow models. So suppose you just have any scheme over K, a smooth scheme over K. And we say that a smooth scheme A over R, the Neron model of A, is a smooth scheme, script A over R, that satisfies this property.
which that holds for all smooth knots. This is called the narrow mapping property. So some remarks. So the narrow mapping property specifies the functor of points of script A, but only on smooth systems. That's one way with you, maybe the way that you should think about it. You know, it's telling you that hom from x to a is hom from x to a over k. So it's really defining the functor points of this thing on smooth schemes. And we insisted that our script A was smooth. So since A is required to be a smooth scheme, this property specifies it uniquely to isomorphism by your native one. definition really does single out a unique thing as the narrow model. I mean, it may not exist, but it's unique that it exists. Uh, so the definition, I mean, you can apply it to any scheme A over K, any smooth scheme, but we're only going to be dealing with the viewing variety scheme. That's the only thing you have to think about. Uh, so the main theorem is, of course, that these things exist. Variety than this narrow model exists. This one is script, this one is not script. So, an important special case of this narrow mapping property is when you take script X to just be spec R itself. So in that case, it says that the R points of the neuron model is equal to the K points of A. So that's something that we already saw in the elliptic curve case, but that's, that's true in general. And that's maybe the best motivation for this mapping property. All K points extend to R points, the same thing is true for this case. And so it's not true. This, this equality is not true if you pass through extensions of K. And that's reflective of the fact that neuron models don't base change well. They do for unramified extensions, but not in general. So let me elaborate on that. So suppose that we have some finite extension k prime over k. And let a be the neuron model of a. So a is going to be in variety over k. And let a prime be the neuron model of a base change to k prime. <coughs> So this A prime is a scheme over R prime. And A is a scheme over R. And they're both smooth. So I can base change A to R prime and get a smooth scheme. And of course, it's still going to extend. I mean, it's still going to have the same generic fiber. So A tensored over R with R prime is a smooth scheme with generic fiber A K prime. So that's exactly the sort of thing you need to apply the neuron mapping property. So the mapping property implies that you get a canonical map from A tensor over R with R prime to this A prime.
And uh, the fact is that if k prime over k is unramified, let me call this now f for the moment, then f is an isomorphism. And actually, it's also an isomorphism if A has what's called semi-stable reduction, which I'll define in a minute. So we define that for elliptic curves, and in fact, we basically proved this for elliptic curves. And more generally than this, it's just typically not an isomorphism. And in particular, it's typically not true that if I take the Nyard model over K and look at its R points, this is usually not equal to the K prime points of it. So let's think about the, what the special fiber of the narrow model looks like. Maybe the narrow model. And I'll write A sub 0 for the special fiber. This is a smooth group of over K. And I'll put a 0 up top also to mean the identity component. So there's a theorem of Chevalier that says that any smooth connected group scheme is an extension of a abelian variety by a linear group, an affine group. So you can fit this, this guy here into an exact sequence like this. So this guy here is an abelian variety over K. And this thing here is a commutative smooth affine group. I don't remember if I'm being a little sloppy. I don't remember. Does this theorem need perfect, you know, in the ground field? I don't know if it needs perfect or if they only that if you want some other properties or not. But it, it's, it's true for finite fields at least, which is the only case we're going to use it in. And so this L is a commutative smooth affine group scheme. Such a thing as an extension of a torus or a unipotent of a torus. I think it's a product of your perfect. This guy is a torus. That means that over k bar, you look like a product of GMs. And this thing is commutative and unipotent. So over k bar, this thing is a product of GAs. So that, that kind of a structure of this A0 is built out of an abelian variety, a torus, a unipotent part, and also its component group, it's a finite group. You have those pieces. So you can you know, consider these dimensions, like dimension of the of T is called like the toric rank of A. And the dimension of U is the unipotent rank. And you also have the dimension of this B, the abelian variety part. And these add up to the dimension of A. And these numbers are invariants of, of A, and they sort of generalize you know, the idea of having multiplicative or additive or good reduction in the case of the curves. In the case of elliptic curves, exactly one of these numbers is 1 and the other ones are 0. So this is how the story works in general. At least over k bar, that's true. I mean, it's a commutative thing. Is that true over k? So 
So you say that, so here's the definition. Uh, A has good reduction if it extends to an abelian scheme over R. So an abelian scheme, this is a proper smooth group scheme with geometrically connected fibers. And this is equivalent to the T and the U vanishing. And it implies that the component group of the narrow model is zero. And in fact, if you have good reduction, then the narrow model itself is the Abelian scheme extending the thing we started with. So this is a direct generalization of good reduction for elliptic curves. And then there's also a notion of semi-stable reduction. A has semi-stable reduction if this unicorn part vanishes. So in that case, the special fiber is, I mean, the connected component of the special fiber is an extension of the abelian variety of that torus, which is called a semi-abelian variety sometimes. So uh, I want to mention the generalizations of the Naranag Shafrevich theorem I said last time. It basically goes exactly the same way, but uh, good to know. So Naranag Shafrevich. Last time I stated this is one theorem. I'm going to break it up into two pieces now. So, uh, this is called this criterion, the Naranag Shafrevich criterion, but I think it was first proved by Sarah and Tate. So it says that A has good reduction, even only if it's state modules on that one. And run by representation of the Gal group. So here L is a prime that's invertible or not. And the proof of this is the same as in the elliptic curve case. I mean, the idea is that well, if you have good reduction, you extend to an abelian scheme. And so your L to the N torsion is a finite tau scheme over R. And so that means that it's unramified as a Gal representation. And conversely, if you're unramified as a Gal representation, then you can, I mean, it's this thing again where you look at the L to the N torsion that has size L to the 2NG, and you can show that injects into the special fiber, the L to the N torsion there. So you have a lot of L to the N torsion there. And then just by the structure of the special fiber of the narrow model, I mean, if you had any torus part or unicorn part, you couldn't possibly have enough L to the N torsion. Right? Because unicorn things have no torsion. And GM, I mean, if you have a torus of dimension N, torus of dimension D, if L to the N torsion looks like L to the ND. Whereas for an abelian variety, it would be L to the 2 of D. So just by the sort of combinatorics of how the dimensions work out, you're forced to have good reduction. And that's basically how the proof goes. It's the same as the old curve. And then there's uh, a second part for semi-stable reduction. And I believe this was first proved by Grothendieck. Um, it's in SGA 7. And it says that A has semi-stable reduction. If and only if inertia acts you importantly. And I don't think this is very hard to prove, but I think it takes a little more work than the elliptic curve case. The elliptic curve case is so small that it's kind of easy, but here you have to prove a bit more. All right, so the, I guess the last thing I'll do is uh, the semi-stable reduction theorem, which we did for elliptic curves, but uh, I want to prove it in the abelian variety case given these two theorems, because I think the proof's kind of nice.
So it says that there exists a finite extension k prime over k over which you get semi state reduction. So this is again like the elliptic curve case. You could always make a phase change so that you get either multiplicative or good reduction. And as in the elliptic curve case, once you get to the semi stable place, the neuron model kind of stabilizes. To a phase change after you get out there. And so let's prove this. I'm just going to do the case for k in the finite extension of QP. So it suffices to find an extension where inertia acts uniformly, like Rosen did. Right? And And what we'll prove is that this is just a fact about any aliotic representation. It has nothing to do with elliptic curves or abelian brackets. So this is true for any aliotic representation. V of our Galois group and K. Any continuous aliotic representation. And so let's let's say why. So first of all, the wild inertia group. This is a pro p group. And so if you have a pro p thing acting continuously on an L-adic space, pass the factor through a finite quotient. So that means that we can pass to a finite extension of k where wild inertia acts true. So just assume now that wild inertia acts trivially. So that means that Galois action with a module factors through the wild inertia quotient. This quotient gamma. K mod wild. And this group is very manageable. So this, this is an extension of the unramified Galois group by the tame inertia group. It has two topological generators. This is generated topologically by two elements F and tau. So this is a lift of Rubinius. And this is a generator for tame inertia. So it's generated by the, those two things topologically, and it satisfies one relation, which is that if you conjugate tau by f, you get the qth power of tau, which is the size of the rest of the field. So tau here is generating the entire inertia group. So we just want to show that that acts unipotently after we go to an extension. Yeah, I, I don't know a good notation for that. So the point is that tau and its qth power are conjugate linear transformations of the And so if, you have, if we name the eigenvalues of tau, say that alpha 1 up to alpha n are the eigenvalues of tau, then the eigenvalues of tau to the q are just the qth powers of this. And since the matrices are conjugate, their eigenvalues are the same. So we must have that alpha i to the q is equal to that alpha of sigma i, for some permutation sigma i. And so if you do this relation n times, you see that alpha of i to the q to the n is equal to alpha to the alpha of i. So in other words, 
alpha to the i, alpha sub i raised to the e power is one, where e here is q to the n minus one. So the eigenvalues of tau are roots of unity. So I just raise tau to the e power, and the eigenvalues become one, and it's uniform. And you achieve that if you pass through an extension of ramification index. If you pick a extension like this, then the tau for k prime is equal to tau for k to e power, and its eigenvalues are 1. 